I think it's fair to say that LDL cholesterol measurements are now obsolete. I know that might sound like a bold statement because you've gone to your mainstream medical doctor. You were told that your LDL cholesterol levels are concerning, so you might need to go on certain medications. Well, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what is actually going on. We're going to focus on apolipoprotein B, which is a proteinaceous compound on the extracellular surface of all of the atherogenic lipoprotein particles that are floating around in your body. The LDL cholesterol measurement that you get from your doctor or the hospital, it's actually an estimate known as the Friedwald equation, which gets more and more inaccurate the more and more metabolically unhealthy you get. And this is widely recognized. So we need to reframe the paradigm away from just looking at mathematical estimations for your LDL cholesterol and focus on ApoB. I know this sounds like a big multi-syllabic word, apolipoprotein B. The concepts are very simple. This is a really affordable test and we're going to talk more about what apolipoprotein B is, what it does, and why it's more sensitive and specific than just measuring LDL cholesterol. There's many papers out here on apolipoprotein B and its links with cardiovascular disease, but suffice it to say, the research is quite clear. Apolipoprotein B is causally related to atherosclerosis, the process of the narrowing and the occlusion of your vessels, including the coronary artery, which is linked to major cardiovascular events. So it's important that you understand and know your ApoB levels, not just looking at your LDL cholesterol estimates via the Friedwald equation. So the paper that we're going to dive into today is titled Apolipoprotein B in Cardiovascular Disease, Biomarkers and Potential Therapeutic Target. Here's a screenshot of my own measurements. I've been measuring my ApoB since 2009. My levels hover around 75 to 80. Uh, it depends upon if I had a fatty meal the night before, how long I fasted, how much exercise I've done, whether or not I did a non-fasting or fasting lipid levels. But here you can see my most recent measurement. Uh, the level is 80. And this is in the same units that you would normally get your HDL or LDL cholesterol milligrams per deciliter. And the high levels start to, you know, concerning levels, people like Dr. Peter Atia and others who talk about cardiovascular disease prevention risk, like to see ApoB levels, I think in their eyes, under 60. So my levels might be on the higher side than normal, but I think it's important to recognize that the environment, the oxidative environment in your body, how much insulin sensitive you are or the underlying inflammation, we're going to talk about the oxidation of ApoB and, and the LDL cholesterol as a key initiation process in the development of atherosclerosis. So you might be saying, well, what is ApoB? Well, here's a picture of ApoB. So as you can see here, apolipoprotein B100 is a protein that is on your VLDL, intermediate density lipoprotein, IDL, and LDL, as well as lipoprotein little a. And so these are the four of the five atherogenic particles. So it's really important to recognize that when you're measuring ApoB, in contrast to just measuring or really estimating your LDL cholesterol, you're getting a direct measurement of the quantity of atherogenic lipoproteins in your blood. And so every atherogenic lipoprotein has only one apolipoprotein B100 on it. And so that's this uh, LDL particle here. This could be a lipoprotein little a. This is just an image that could also be VLDL or IDL. But it's important to recognize this is a one-to-one -one relationship. So again, when you measure your LDL cholesterol, you're actually measuring the cholesterol content in your low density lipoproteins. This is not directly measuring the lipoproteins themselves. I think a lot of people get confused with this. So if we know that apolipoprotein B is causally related to the process of atherosclerosis, you want to know how many apolipoprotein B particles you have, not how much cholesterol is in your lipoproteins. That's irrelevant because as it turns out, the more insulin resistant you get, the more triglyceride enriched your lipoproteins get. And that's why LDL cholesterol doesn't correlate directly with risk, okay? So I think it's really important to recognize that. So as the scientists say, a single ApoB100 molecule is contained per particle of very low density lipoprotein, intermediate density lipoprotein, low density lipoprotein, or bad cholesterol in lipoprotein A. This unique one ApoB per particle ratio makes plasma ApoB concentration a direct measure of the number of circulating atherogenic lipoproteins. ApoB levels indicate the atherogenic particle concentration independent of the particle cholesterol content, which is variable. So I think that's important to recognize that in your, your blood is water soluble, your plasma is water soluble. So this is why glucose and proteins can freely float around. They do not need to be bound up to lipoproteins. 
but we know that cholesterol, free cholesterol, and lipids, triglycerides, or free fatty acids, they are not soluble in water. You've all made pasta before. When you put olive oil or butter, when you're cooking pasta, it floats to the top. Even when you make bone broth, what happens to the fat? It rises to the top. It's more dense. And so that's why you need these lipoprotein particles because they carry around triglycerides, free fatty acids, and cholesterol inside their proteinaceous water-soluble sphere. So why LDL is the major cholesterol-carrying serum lipoprotein, it, it is primarily the therapeutic target for management and prevention of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. There is strong evidence that ApoB is a more accurate indicator of cardiovascular risk than either total cholesterol or LDL cholesterol. The scientists say one avenue that merits exploration is apolipoprotein B and its prominent position as a causal factor in atherosclerosis. I want to provide a little caveat here. So we do know that atherosclerotic lesions or plaque are characterized by the formation of these foam cell fatty streaks, but there is a key oxidation step that renders the lipoprotein to become engulfed by these macrophages within the vascular endothelium, which is the lumen or the interior portion of your vessels. So it's important to recognize that oxidation and preventing oxidation by maintaining a metabolically healthy diet and lifestyle and not consuming highly oxidizable seed oils like canola, cottonseed, sunflower, and the like, and soy, because these oils become part of your body. They get incorporated into your body, and if they're more readily to be oxidized, you can increase the free radical oxidative environment and therefore promote and further exacerbate the process of cardiovascular disease known as atherosclerosis, which again narrows the, the pipe, so, so to speak, if you think about it like that. But that process and that step, as indicated in this figure, is key, and that's important to recognize because we know that proxies of oxidative stress and thrombosis and so forth, fibrinogen and having other c rats or protein, these associated biomarkers are linked with higher risk of atherosclerosis, not just having high levels of the lipoprotein. So that's important to recognize. Okay. So before we continue on, friends, I just want to thank you all for being here. Thanks for hitting that like button. If you're enjoying this content, you know what to do. Be sure to share this as a direct text message with a friend so that they can be up to speed on the latest science. Because I still see clients all the time who come to me and say, hey, my LDL cholesterol is high. I say, do you have apolipoprotein B measured on your blood? Apo what? They say, well, my doctor just focused on LDL cholesterol. Most doctors are ignoring this. So it's time. It's 2023. It's time that we focus on the actual research. This is being talked about in the medical literature. You should not be just focusing on LDL cholesterol. You need to be looking at your ApoB levels and the ratio of ApoB to ApoA1, which we're not going to focus in on today, but ApoA1 is a a particle. It's like ApoB, but it's on your protective HDL cholesterol. And so that ratio is important as is the total number of ApoB. Also, friends, you know, metabolic health is so important for you. And especially when it comes to supporting cardiovascular health. And that's why we created the Berberine Fasting Accelerator over at Myoscience. This is a great way to kickstart your fast. You can take this in the evening, especially if you're prone to food cravings, having cookies and ice cream and different snacks after dinner. You know that the closer that you eat to bedtime, that increases your risk of having weight gain and, and not having the body composition that is supportive of metabolic health. So check out myoscience.com, that's M-Y-O-X-C-I-E-N-C.com, and save on the Berberine Fasting Accelerator, a really unique product that features a, pur a purified berberine hydrochloride, along with synergistic nutrients like alpha-lipoic acid and biotin that help it work better. And this, again, initiates the fasting physiology. You can take it twice a day, once in the morning, or you know once or twice, uh, two capsules in the morning or two capsules in the evening around mealtime. If you take it with a meal, that's fine, or shortly after, that is fine as well. So I'll put links in the description below. So I want to focus in on over the last 30 years, you know, the medical community has focused almost at nauseum on lowering LDL cholesterol. But if you think about what is the number one reason why people die prematurely, it's still heart disease. And many of these people actually have low or normal LDL cholesterol because we have been estimating via the Friedwald equation people's LDL cholesterol. So the scientists say, for the past 30 years, studies have shown that decreasing LDL cholesterol significantly decreases the risk of coronary artery disease. However, cardiovascular risk reduction achieved via lipid-lowering therapy in most clinical studies does not exceed 30%. So yes, we're lowering people's cholesterol, but some people are still having atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease. And so furthermore, recent meta-analysis have shown that despite achieving LDL cholesterol targets with lipid-lowering treatment, there's still a high residual risk of coronary artery disease events 
And this should be addressed by clinicians because we're missing the atherosclerotic particles. We're not looking at ApoB, right? And so they say in the Prove It TMI trial, so there's all these different trials that look at LDL cholesterol levels and the association with atherosclerotic disease and major cardiovascular events. They say 22.7% of participants still had major cardiovascular events at two years follow-up despite achieving the recommended LDL cholesterol levels, suggesting a more sensitive biomarker may be necessary to minimize subsequent cardiovascular events. Now, what are these biomarkers specifically? It's not just ApoB. It's looking at C-reactive protein, looking at triglycerides, looking at fibrinogen, looking at liver enzymes. You know, we have to start to look at this in a constellation, not just looking at, oh my gosh, is there one biomarker elevated or not? And focusing only on LDL cholesterol. And so in our blood work masterclass, we've talked all about these other related biomarkers and how to interpret them and look at them in terms of a, the big picture pattern of what's going on. Because we do know that people with familial hypercholesterolemia, FH, these are people that have extraordinary high LDL cholesterol levels and also lipid levels. Not all of them develop cardiovascular disease. Now you might say, well, why is that? Well, a subset of them that also have high fibrinogen and high C-reactive protein are more likely to develop cardiovascular disease because of the metabolic milieu that is oxidizing their lipoproteins and forming or helping to foster the creation of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and narrowing of the vessels, particularly within the heart and potentially causing uh, clotting cascades in the brain. So we've talked about the, the disassociation between dietary cholesterol and serum cholesterol. This figure three just helps to really illustrate that. We know that dietary cholesterol has little impact on serum cholesterol. Most of your cholesterol that you should be concerned about, your atherogenic, your VLDL, your IDL, your LDL, your LP little a, all of which, by the way, have apolipoprotein B, is made by your liver. And so that's why it all is also important to look at your liver enzymes. The so-called amino transferase enzymes, not just AST, not just ALT, but also GGT, gamma glutamyl transpeptidase. A lot of times, I would say 90% of the times when I work with clients, the doctors have omitted this very important liver enzyme. So when your liver starts to get infiltrated with fat, when you're metabolically unhealthy, that enzyme is one of the first to increase along with ALT. And so the liver is a key window into metabolic health. And as you can see here, the liver starts to make these, these lipoproteins based upon density, starting at the very dense lipoproteins known as VLDL, which have one apolipoprotein B. Those can be metabolized into the intermediate density lipoprotein and then eventually LDL. And when it becomes oxidized or modified, that's theorized to create LP little a, which is known as the widowmaker uh, lipoprotein. Okay, but as you can see here, the oxidative modification is essential. So if you can limit the amount of industrial seed oils and improve your metabolic health and exercise and decrease chronic inflammatory cascades in the body, you can reduce the probability that your lipoproteins can become modified or oxidized and therefore engulfed in the macrophage and be deposited as plaque. So I think a lot of people forget about that. We focus so much on lowering the quantity of particles, but we forget that these particles that are so-called atherogenic need to become modified before they become problematic. And so we have volitional control over our internal metabolic environment that can reduce the odds or the probability that these particles can become modified. And I think this is why there's not so much of a risk. We see people with, you know, cardioangiograms and coronary CAT scans and so forth of their arteries showing zero soft plaque, zero hard plaque, despite the fact that their LDL cholesterols are high. You know, people that are in the carnivore diet community, folks like Jamie Seaman, folks like Sean Baker, these are medical doctors, you know, they've done CT scans of their heart and even uh, ultrasounds of their carotid arteries and see no signs of cardiovascular disease. Now, why is that? Despite the fact that their LDL cholesterol is high, is they're not having French fries, packaged food, industrial seed oils. So their cholesterol particles are not being oxidized. Okay, so that's important to recognize. Now, you might be saying, well, again, why should I care about ApoB, Mike? My doctors just focus on LDL. Here's even more research to convince some of you, and I know you share these videos with your healthcare practitioners, so that's helpful, so thank you. One avenue that merits exploration is apolipoprotein B and its prominent position as a causal factor in atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis is a progressive disease of large and medium-sized muscular arteries characterized by elevated lesions called fibrous plaques that encroach upon the vessel lumen and disturb blood flow. So this is what happens when you have a heart attack. It's one of the coronary arteries. These are arteries that are supplying the fuel for the heart and they become clogged or they get stenosis or occlusion or narrowing 
and they lose blood flow and the heart starts to freak out. And that is literally, I'm really simplifying this. That is the, the root cause of a myocardial infarction or heart attack is your heart muscle is starving for energy because it is it is the vessels that that give the blood the oxygen have become occluded by this process because they're very very small within the coronary arteries and so atherosclerosis is the major cause of cardiovascular disease a hallmark of atherosclerosis is the retention of cholesterol rich low density lipoproteins and other i don't want to focus on that and other apoB containing lipoproteins within the arterial wall why did I emphasize another? Because if you just focus on LDL cholesterol, you're missing the VLDL, the IDL, the remnant lipoproteins. You're missing the lipoprotein little a. You're missing all the other atherogenic particles. And it turns out that when, as I mentioned before, when your triglycerides start to increase, that makes the LDL cholesterol measurement more inaccurate because again, these lipoproteins are enriched in triglycerides. And so that creates a little dysfunction. And most doctors know this when, or most cardiologists do know this when it comes to measuring low density lipoprotein in people with prediabetes and people with hypertriglyceridemia or elevated levels of triglycerides. The, the, the reliance or the accuracy of LDL uh, tends to decrease inversely with elevations in triglycerides. So if you're a person who has a fasting triglyceride of 140, you're L, you can just basically throw out your LDL cholesterol measurement and focus in on LDL cholesterol. So the scientists say, currently the American Heart Association recommends a screening lipid panel every four to six years in patients over the age of 20. However, patients with cardiovascular disease or at high risk of cardiovascular related events, i.e. having a family history, first degree relative, should be screened more frequently. I recommend people get blood work once a year, once every 18 months. If you're over the age of 40, I think you should get labs every year. This is a $200 investment. It's not a lot. It's a small amount of blood. Uh, I think it's it's just good insurance policy uh, to see major trends that shift in one way or the other. A routine lipid panel consists of total cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, and triglycerides, among other cholesterol ratios. Total cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, and triglycerides are directly measured, right? So we can directly measure total cholesterol, whereas the LDL cholesterol levels are estimated using this Friedwald equation. Again, a lot of people don't even know this. Some healthcare practitioners, it's just an estimate. So when your doctor says, we need to give you a drug based upon an estimate, you say, mm, no, what I want to do is I want to directly measure my ApoB. The Friedwald equation, which is subject to inaccuracy in the presence of high triglycerides and other conditions like diabetes, estimates LDL cholesterol as total cholesterol minus HDL cholesterol and very low density cholesterol. Um, and so that is important to know that this is an estimation, friends. So if you're battling with your healthcare practitioner about whether or not to go on a statin, please go to them and say, I want to directly measure. Right, I want to use, I mean, it's kind of funny, more, more inclusive language, right? It's, if you think about looking at ApoB, it's including all the other atherogenic lipoproteins. So it's really important. So moreover, in individuals with diabetes and metabolic syndrome, although LDLC levels are normal, the overall lipid profile is proatherogenic with high triglycerides and low HDL cholesterol. The added atherogenic factor in those people with diabetes and metabolic syndrome is a significant increase in small, dense particles. These unique lipid abnormalities pose increased risk for cardiovascular events, but the normal LDL cholesterol levels can mislead clinicians who might not initiate lipid-lowering therapy. So I think it's it's important to recognize that the, the LDL cholesterol is really missing a large subset of people who might have atherogenic risk. And so I think the bottom line here, my friends, you have enough data to, and this is a $12 test. I mean, when I add ApoB onto my labs, it increases the cost $12. This is not a deal breaker for a lot of people. So uh, please, if you're struggling with your doctor, find a doctor who will have an open mind enough to measure your ApoB because we know that LDL cholesterol is missing a lot of people in terms of risk. And then you can make better decisions about your diet, about your exercise, about the fat or carb content in the diet, and whether or not you might need to go on medications or not to lower your ApoB. So hopefully you enjoyed this content. Thanks as always for sharing it. Thanks for hitting that like button and we'll catch you on a future episode down the road. Bye now.